Can someone just send a chat on the um, Skype so that I can check, please? I am on it. Thanks. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I will be introducing these presenters. Apologies in advance if I say your names wrong. Um, so we're happy to welcome Susan Smith Kung from the Archive of the Indigenous Languages of Latin America at the University of Texas at Austin, Mandana Seyfedinipur from SOAS University of London, Nick T. Berger from the University of Melbourne, Paul Trilsbeck from the Language Archive, Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics, and Raina Heaton from the University of Oklahoma to present Relating the Past, Present, and Future Archiving Language Collections. Mahalo, everyone. Can we go back one slide, please? Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you to Relating the Past, Present, and Future Archiving Language Collections. Now, next slide. We respectfully acknowledge the sovereignty of the land and people of Hawaii, where this conference was hosted. And we also extend that respect to any First Nations. There are um, three 10 minute sessions dedicated to questions and answers, which are indicated on this slide in the outline in bold type. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and we have someone monitoring the chat for us and we will answer as many of those questions as we can once we get to that section. Next slide. Um, so we just did introductions, and uh, but we're gonna put names with faces um, very quickly. I'm Susan smith Kung from Isla. Um, Paul. Hi, I'm Paul Trilsbeek from the Language Archive at the Max Planck Institute for Slack Linguistics. I am Mandana Sefinipur from the Endangered Languages Archive at SOAS in London. I'm Zach O'Hagan from the California Language Archive at UC Berkeley. I'm Raina Heaton from the Native American Languages Collection at the University of Oklahoma. I'm Nick T. Berger from the University of Melbourne and uh, Paradisic. Next slide, please. Okay, we have a quick poll. Um, we're going to put this poll up and it's anonymous and it's optional, but we invite you to take it and then we'll show the results during the first Q&A session. Okay, so I'm going to keep talking. We're going to leave that poll up while people fill it out. <clears throat> so while the practice of archiving the results of language documentation has been around for a few centuries, has really been a regular practice in the last 20 years with the founding of several digital archives that are dedicated specifically to preserving records of endangered or underrepresented languages and cultures. Language archives play an important role in the language documentation community. The collective goal of these archives is to preserve valuable collections of language materials from the past and the present various stakeholder groups right now. Creating high quality archive collections takes significant effort and requires respectful relationships between the language community, the documenter, the depositor, the um, representative of the uh, deposit to the archive and the staff who work in the archives. And it also takes a lot of patience and data management. So we're here today to teach some of these data management practices that will help you all create well-organized, well-described archival records that are useful to yourselves, your collaborators, your communities, your heirs, and more. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so Delamon is an international network of archives that specialize in language documentation collections. We give an award every other year to recognize an early career language documenter who has done outstanding work in creating a rich multimedia collection. Congratulations to Carolyn. Carol Next slide, please. This workshop is not intended to teach participants how to archive materials in any specific repository 
or to explain the differences between our repositories or our archive workflows. This is also not a workshop about how to build a digital repository. What it is, is a workshop that's intended to teach some basic data management practices that will help you keep your data and metadata organized. It will facilitate their ingestion into any digital repository or archive that you choose to use. And it will facilitate their current and future discoverability and reuse. Next slide. The content presented in this workshop is based on the open educational resource called Archiving for the Future, Simple Steps for Archiving Language Documentation Collections. This is a free online course designed to teach language documenters, activists, teachers, researchers, and have language documentation materials in a digital repository. Next slide. The course teaches basic principles of data management and archiving by breaking them down into nine simple steps that can be done across three phases of work before, during, and after you record or create the language documentation materials, which we're also sometimes calling the data. Today, we'll give you a quick overview of these nine steps. And if you want more information, we invite you to consult the course or follow up with any of the workshop presenters. Next slide. So we're getting a lot of doorbells ringing um, with all the admit messages. So I hope that's not too distracting. Um, so I apologize for that. I don't think I have a way to, to change that. So step one, choose your archive. It's a good idea to choose your archive before you begin a new project and start creating audio and video recordings or other files. Knowing the requirements of the files, and it will help to ensure that you are collecting the relevant contextual information and metadata. Next slide. Throughout this workshop, we'll be using the terms language archive, digital repository, and data repository somewhat interchangeably. Um, sometimes a language archive is slightly different from other sorts of data repositories because they really focus on making sure that there's appropriate metadata about languages, whereas other data archives might not put quite that emphasis on the, um, the information. <clears throat> Language archives have a responsibility to the people that we serve to make the materials available for the long term. Thus, the primary purpose of digital repositories is to ensure long-term preservation and accessibility of the materials. By long-term preservation, I mean making sure the files and their contents last a long time. And by accessibility, I mean and in the future. Repositories are committed to migrating the data and the metadata to new formats. So once you put the data into the archive, the rest of the work is done by the archive for you. You don't have to worry about the files becoming obsolete. Archives also provide citable public versions of data and data sets that can be used for research or other purposes. However, they are not meant to be temporary file storage or social media platforms. Okay, let's go to the next side, slide, please. There are some key differences between repositories on the one hand and platforms for sharing, streaming, and social media on the other. So repositories are meant to be stable distribution platforms in which the files are not likely to change or be deleted, and the material can be cited versus media storage platforms where the files are likely to be moved, deleted, changed, or edited. It's not going to be as permanent. ...to the longevity of the materials that are stored there. Whereas with these commercial sites, they are exactly that. They're commercial services that are subject to frequent change and discontinuity of service. Repositories also differ from websites or streaming services like YouTube or Vimeo or SoundCloud in that the repositories can be slightly less easy to navigate and access compared to the streaming services, which are very easy to access and extremely easy to navigate. But the repositories are committed to long-term preservation, but, and you don't get that kind of commitment from the streaming services. Next slide, please. So how do you pick an archive? Unfortunately, there's no single path to follow to choose your archive. Rather, you should consider several questions, maybe everything on this slide, maybe not, 
maybe other questions will um, present themselves to you. But some of the things you need to consider are based archive that you can use. Do you already have a relationship with a specific archive? And if so, do you wanna keep all of the materials that you collect together in one archive? Or are you interested in spreading them around? Is there a Delamont archive that would be a good fit for the language? Is there an aerial archive, meaning a particular, uh, an archive with a particular focus or region of the world that it focuses on that might be a good fit for the, the language that uh, you are archiving? Will some or all of the language data have to be restricted? What are the repository's policies regarding public versus restricted data? Because that might um, be a huge consideration in your choice of repository. And finally, can the language community access the archive? And this is probably the most important question because if not, is there a regional archive or institution that community members can access that might be a better home for this material? Next slide. Organizing community access is extremely important and it cannot be underemphasized. Um, it can't, I mean, it cannot be overemphasized. So you really need to seek out an archive that the speech community can access. How you do this is gonna vary. There's no like one solution that works for everyone. So some people have established um, some sort of community access through a memorandum of understanding with between communities and, and outsiders. Um, other people have immediately shared copies of all collected materials with the people who contributed to their creation. Um, some people have tried to establish a physical or digital archive within the community. Sometimes these are called jukebox archives in the literature. Um, other people find that it's easier to establish a physical archive and put physical copies of things into this archive. Um, you can share a digital or physical copy of all of the materials You know, this might be a school, a library, some sort of local archive or museum, a governmental office or cultural program in the community's town. Um, Nick has a really great presentation in the next session about how to use a local Raspberry Pi for nearby com um, community smartphone access. So that session's right after this one in session 2.1. And bear in mind that sometimes the easiest way to provide access might be to put the video files on YouTube in a streaming service, in addition to archiving them for permanence and long-term preservation and accessibility. All right, I'll pass the floor to Nick. The next uh, section is gonna be discussing um, more nuts and bolts of um, naming your files and, and we'll move on to other aspects of archiving as well. Next slide, please. When you begin to think about archiving, you have to think of what needs to be it actually needs to be archived. And for our purposes, we would consider the objects in your collection to be things like recordings, so uh, audio recordings, video recordings, and photographs, but also derived items, so transcripts, uh, texts, dictionaries, all of this should be archived. Think of people in the future wanting to have access to dictionaries, for example, to be able to rework them. Thanks. So when you uh, put something into the archive, you should be able to cite down to the level of the data that you've put in there. And ideally with transcripts, for, for example, you should be able to cite all the way down to a sentence or an utterance uh, in your transcripts. To do this, you have to maintain a file name through your research process. So don't change your file names. Once you've captured a file off a device, off a camera or an audio recorder, uh, it will have usually a, a name assigned by that. But don't change it again. Once it goes into the archive, the archive will probably assign digital object identifiers or handles but you need to track your name uh, and we you know, talk about persistent identification of, of these objects so that you don't get confused. And when you cite something, you know that it's always going to be that particular thing that you're citing. Next. So what sort of file names should you use? Uh, 
I would really encourage you not to get carried away and not to put too much information into the file name, um, but leave that for the metadata that's in the catalog. So use very simple characters. Um, various computer systems are still having problem with um, the extended Unicode set. So try and keep your um, file names to using uh, fairly standard um, ASCII characters. Next. So at the top there, you can see a, a sort of exuberant name that's 37 characters long and it includes the date. Microphone brand, the time of the start of, you know, people do this. We see all kinds of file names coming in. And then uh, in the middle of the screen, you can see uh, a name that has the language code, uh, the date, the place, person and gender. But the problem with names like uh, this is that you know, you may have multiple uh, languages in a file, uh, you may have multiple speakers, and how do you deal with that if you're including that information in the file name? So much better to have a file name that's not too long and, for example, at the bottom there's a file name that has the date and it has a very simple um, title of the uh, content to maybe help you remember what's in the file when you look at that file name. Next. If you're considering archiving, then you could also talk to the archive in advance of creating your files uh, and find out if they have any specific um, requirements for how you can name your file. And so you shouldn't use hyphens in yours. Um, we would convert them to underscores, for example. Uh, and so, yeah, check with your um, archives to make sure that whatever naming convention that you come up with uh, will fit with, with them as well. Next. Okay, now I'm passing on. Yes, so uh, step three, pick enduring file formats. So uh, most domain-specific archives, including language archives, they use specific file formats for archiving and for preservation. Uh, many archives even require depositors to only use specific file formats for their deposits. Archives select their recommended or required formats based on a number of criteria. So one is uh, the quality of the format. For example, WAVE is better quality compared to MPEG-3. Um, also, uh, long-term preservation suitability, so whether a file format will last for uh, a while and whether it can easily be converted in the next format that comes along without losing information. Those are aspects that play a role. Also, openness of the format. Open formats are preferred over proprietary formats because also they are better suited for long-term uh, preservation. And uh, formal standards or de facto standards within the discipline are taken into account as well. And there may be other te technical aspects of the format. So for example, whether it can be automatically validated. Um, now, uh, these recommended or required archival formats, they may differ from the formats that you use to collect your data, uh, in which case conversions are needed before uh, archiving. Um, Lossy compressed formats, they remove information that is seen as less relevant for human perception. For example, MP3 files and audio uh, remove. The removal of this information might have some influence on, for example, phonetic analyses uh, with, with some kind of program like Pratt. So um, it's usually advised to, to not use compression uh, if possible at all. Um, conversions may result in loss of quality, uh, in particular when converting from one lossy compressed format to another, for example, from MPEG-2 video to MPEG-4, uh, and that is becomes apparent in particular after several conversion steps. Also, keep in mind that converting from a lossy compressed format from which information has been taken out to an uncompressed format does not bring back this information that has been, that's been thrown out. So for example, if you convert an MP3 to a WAV file, it's not all of a sudden going to bring back this information. So try to collect your materials in archival formats whenever that's practically possible. Um, in the case of audio, and SD cards are, are cheap enough, so there's really no reason not to record uncompressed WAV files. Um, recording uncompressed video is not really 
currently possible yet with normal cameras um, and also the storage requirements are still huge. Um, some archives may allow you to deposit your original files and we'll do the conversion for you. Other archives will require you to convert them yourself following their guidance. Just a few examples of recommended formats. So for audio, uh, uncompressed wave, 16 or 24 bits, 44.1 or 48 kilohertz. Some recorders are capable of recording 96 or even 192 kilohertz, but that's really has no added value for, for field recordings and only makes the files bigger. So that's not recommended. For video, MPEG-4 is usually uh, accepted by most archives. However, within MPEG-4, there are still lots of options for, for uh, settings. Check with the archive for recommended settings. For images, TIFF uh, is usually used for scans or for raw images or JPEG for just regular uh, images that come off the digital camera. For uh, multi-tiered text, uh, Elan, for example, uh, and for Fieldworks, flex text formats, which are XML-based formats, they're better suited for this type of kind of document than a Word file or a PDF file. Check with the archive you'll be working with uh, for their exact recommendations and requirements and procedures. Step four is about understanding uh, metadata. What is metadata? Well, probably the shortest possible definition is uh, metadata is data about data. And when we speak about metadata, we also mean structured data about data. So not just some random notes scribbled on a piece of paper, but data collected according to a certain uh, predefined structure. Descriptive, administrative uh, metadata, technical metadata. Sometimes this is part of the file itself embedded. Um, but when we speak of metadata in relation to an archival deposit, we typically mean descriptive metadata. So information about the files that you are depositing in terms of their content and the context in which they were collected. So you could also say the who, the what, the where, and the when of a document or a file. Descriptive metadata is really essential for discovery and identification of archive, archive materials. Um, archives contain hundreds of thousands of files. If none of those would be adequately described with metadata, archives would be kind of data graveyards. So examples of uh, fields that you might find in, in the descriptive metadata standard is, for example, the content language name, the language that's being spoken in a recording, the associated ISO code of that particular language, uh, location of the recording, uh, recording date, name, person making the recording, linguistic genre, a general content description, and so forth. Now, there are many different uh, metadata standards around for describing resources. Um, and language archives use a, a number of them. For example, Dublin Core metadata. OLAC metadata, IMD, uh, SIMD, or MODS metadata. And they are all somewhat different. The level of detail uh, and the number of fields within these formats varies. So familiarize yourself with the metadata requirements of the archive you will be working with. And if you don't know, know yet which archive you'll be working with, then it, it wouldn't hurt to look at a couple of these standards to have a bit of an idea. Most metadata standards also use uh, lists of possible values for certain fields, so-called controlled vocabularies. And the purpose of such a controlled vocabulary is to provide consistency in the used terminology and thereby improving uh, by an authority such as the Library of Congress or the, the ISO uh, standards organization. Now, you may find sometimes that if a CV is used, that it doesn't provide the exact term that you need to describe your resource. Still, um, consider using a close match rather than filling in no value at all. Because sparsely filled in metadata reduces the likelihood of your materials showing up in search results. Also, sometimes a controlled vocabulary is optional, so you can either choose a value from the list or provide a different value yourself. But in also in this case, if there is a close match, consider using it rather than your own term, because again, that will uh, increase the likelihood of your materials being found. Examples of controlled vocabularies are lists of countries, lists of genres, lists of actor roles, for example. 
Um, another thing you need to consider when depositing uh, collections is uh, rights metadata. Uh, the rights metadata contains information about And the possibilities for assigning licenses and granting or restricting access, they vary per archive. So again, uh, check with the archive you'll be working with what, what their possibilities are. Well, for who are you creating the metadata? That's also a question you should ask yourself. Uh, Nicolas Himmelmann uh, said in his uh, chapter in uh, the 2006 book, uh, um, but language documentation is uh, a language documentation is elastic multipurpose record of a language. Users of such a multipurpose document would include the speech community itself, national and international agencies concerned with education and language planning, as well as researchers in various disciplines, linguistics, anthropology, oral history, and etc. So when compiling metadata, try to think of these different user groups and what would be relevant for them in order to find materials. Um, so for the international research community, metadata needs to be in English, but if you want to facilitate access by a speech community, you may want to include a description in a different language as well. Um, also try to think of research disciplines other than linguistics or anthropology. So for example, you may want to include a Latin plant name in addition to the indigenous or the English name, if you happen to know it. Now, what does the metadata look like once it ends up in the archive? So this is an example from, from Isla, an item in Isla. And what is interesting here is that Isla allows you to also enter a title and a description in the indigenous language. Here's an example from ELAR, a new interface of ELAR. Uh, here you see that there are quite a number of, of actors, so people who play the role uh, with, in the creation of this resource. And uh, they all have a role, and some, some of them are mentioned more than once with different roles. And these roles are typically things that are taken from such a controlled vocabulary that I was talking about. Of Paradisec, uh, what's interesting here is that for some fields, Paradisec has both a, a strictly defined field, but also a, a freeform field. So for example, here for the date, this is specified in, in, in the strict uh, form, but if you wanted to say uh, second half of 1987, you could enter that in the, uh, in the free form field. Here's an example of language archive. Uh, so here on the left side, you see uh, the basic metadata. Also, it allows you to enter uh, descriptions in multiple languages. And if you then go to the, uh, the box here, you can open it up and see all the the detailed metadata that is entered as, as well. Um, some general considerations, uh, metadata and archive will be public. So do not write sensitive information in the metadata records. Do not include speakers names unless that's what they want explicitly. Be careful with very precise location information. Um, metadata is and therefore you should make a plan of what metadata you want or need to collect and how you're gonna do that. Uh, you should make this plan before starting your data collection. And in the next step after the question and answer uh, session, we will be hearing about collecting metadata during data collection. So uh, right now, uh, Zach is gonna moderate the question and answer session and we'll be hearing the results of the poll. I'm going to end the poll now. <clears throat> yep, I will do that. Oh, you did it. Oh, I did it, sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, Oh, it doesn't tell me how many of you voted anymore. I had written it down on paper. 81% um, uh, of you voted, and I'll just report uh, quickly on what the results were. 100% um, said you uh, plan to archive either new or more language data in the future. 19% um, said you have already archived with city repository. 20% with a community archive. Um, 9% uh, with a different data repository and 48% of you have not yet um, archived. Um, so now we're gonna be transitioning to um, questions from the chat. Um, and the main question we have so far is from uh, Shirley Gabber asking if uh, she could hear more about memorandums of understanding um, in the context of community access to materials. And I think that Susan is going to take this question. Yeah, thank you, Shirley. That's a really great question. Um, 
So memorandum of understanding are uh, less legal, legally binding contract than a contract is. Um, so it, to some extent they are binding and it's um, some universities are using memorandum of understanding between departments that want to do research within a particular community and what Um, and so, you know, the memorandum of understanding lays out in great detail what the roles and the relationships are between all parties who are involved in this particular project. And I, I even hate to use the word research now after the keynote from um, right before this, but uh, it, they frequently are used in academic situations in which different parties are collaborating with each other to accomplish a single goal or project. And so, it lays out in great detail who's going, going to do what, um, what the deliverables will be, um, and who is allowed to use the deliverables and for what purpose. Um, it also kind of flips the narrative on getting informed consent. So it, rather than, you know, like an outsider going into a community and getting informed consent from the participants to participate, the um, outsider goes into some sort of agreement about what they are allowed to do with the results of their research. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. And I put a reference in the chat. Um, there's one paper that was written, um, I think 2006, so it's been a while. And I need to do another, um, I don't know, survey to see if there's, there's any more literature on this exactly. But that particular paper from 2006 includes the steps that the um, University of Victoria did with the um, Holcomb Minum Treaty Group. So um, I think that it's a, it's a document that was published and so they're happy to share it. We also now have a question from Kira Fortier. Um, she asks, what do you see as the benefits drawbacks of using an existing archiving platform versus building a purpose-made system in-house? Take that one. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think I a lot of that. us um, want to take that one. Yeah, everybody wants to jump on that one. <laughs> oh, well, Susan, we go ahead. We have different opinions. <laughs> no, go, Nick. We all have our experience. Yeah, look, this, it's it's very tricky because um, it depends. You know, existing platforms can be expensive. Um, often, you know, they're proprietary, and you're buying into something. Um, making a purpose-built system in-house, uh, which is what we did with Paradisic, I think in the end was a mistake uh, because there, there's so much detail involved um, that unless you can share the infrastructure with other archives. Uh, it can become quite burdensome. So it's it's tricky. Um, we started with a simple FileMaker Pro database um, and then moved to SQL, and now we have a Ruby on Rails system. So I think the thing would be, if you're seriously wanting to do this, that you should talk to the other archives, talk to Delamun um, about the various options that there are. But this sort of ties into the next question too, because um, on the one hand, you have the archiving software, but on the other, then you have... Uh, ways of displaying this. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and that's where something like Mukuru uh, would be a good display system. Omeka is a system that people use for displaying data, but we really need to distinguish the archiving software, which is about preserving and describing and all the metadata stuff that we've talked about up until now, uh, and a system that displays this. So maybe others have other answers they want to give as well. Would anyone else like to say anything about the second question, especially from Bruce Torres uh, that Nick referenced about whether we have suggestions on platforms for hosting local databases um, at an institution? Yeah, I have some thoughts about that one. Um, the easiest thing to do if you're hosting on an institution, if you have an IT department, you need to find out what is already available at the IT department and what programming languages your IT department uses. Because... Um, the answer to what to pick lots of times has to do with what's running that software and does your shop know how to run that software? 
There's an another question now from Justin who asks, what are the roles from outer community PhD linguists to inner community language apprentices regarding the archival language materials? This, this sounds like it's a, a United right States question. Sort of question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can, I, I'll take a stab at this. Um, I think that I hear horror stories on a regular basis of senior PhD linguists who have gone into communities and then they leave they go home, they make copies of all of those cassette tapes or um, open reel tapes or whatever format they were using. And they send that back to the community or they take it back the next time they go. And then later, like, the, and then they forget about it, right? So, okay, I gave it back to the community and now I'm done with it. But really, I think that there needs to be some ongoing communication between this external linguist and the internal um, apprentices who are working in the community on like migrating this stuff into new formats, right? Because it is this ongoing responsibility on the part of all researchers to keep their data in some sort of format that everyone can access it. Um, you know, whether they have the right to access it or not is another matter, but it needs to be in a format where it's accessible. And so it's an ongoing commitment. Um, so once the linguists who left the community uh, CDs, and then maybe he got those CDs and copied them into, you know, MP3s or WAV files or something. Um, he needs to be sharing the materials with the community, checking in with the community, making sure that they have access to the community, uh, to the materials that he originally created. Um, I hear the horror stories where they just, they never even respond to the community's requests to get new copies of the material. Or perhaps they never even copy them in the first place. Yes, I also wanted right. to say there's, there's an issue about ownership and this kind of idea that the data is mine, whatever that means, and it's me who's going to share or not share until I have done this and this, and there's a central problem in that regard. But it's getting better and better, but um, there are a lot of very difficult stories of um, uh, community access to the own materials. I'll just add quickly that the idea that we're advocating here is that, you know, teams of researchers making decisions about archiving those materials. So it's sort of a different matter if you're talking about legacy materials and previous documentation versus hopefully stuff going forward that everybody's working on collaboratively. Great. There is one remaining question from Grant Ayton, but I'm going to postpone it until later since it will touch on some of the things that we'll deal with later about um, how to add or change existing materials. So now we will transition to phase two. Nick. Okay. We're going to talk now about um, collecting metadata. So Paul has outlined uh, what metadata is and the kinds of metadata that we uh, consider in language documentation work. Next slide, please. So we need to collect uh, metadata in the field at the moment at which we create our files. So if you have been in the field and you've recorded files, you know that if you don't name them and write down what's on them straight away, then you've got a terrible task of trying to figure out what's on them. And that probably means you have to listen to them, which is going to take you an awful lot of time. So take uh, notes, good old fashioned field notes on paper. Um, ideally use a waterproof pen so you don't have a disaster when the rain comes or you're on a canoe and your notebook gets dropped into the lagoon. Um, and on those notes, you write who, when, and where. So who's on the recording, when it was recorded, where it was recorded. You can then type that into a structured form, uh, like a spreadsheet, which we'll see in a moment. Thanks, Paul. What's really critical at the beginning of all of this also is that you get permission from the people you work with. Um, that they either sign a consent form, uh, usually universities require some kind of signed consent form, uh, but they can also make an audio 
uh, in your metadata, you'd want to record things like people's names, their age, gender, clan, whatever's locally relevant, um, and also things that you are going to use in your research. So you need to think of what kinds of topics you're interested in uh, for your research, but also locally relevant terms. So if within the community you work with, um, they talk about life stories or local histories or customary stories, these may be ways that you can also describe the material that you're recording. Next. So collect this metadata about the content of what you've recorded, that is who, when, and the topics and whatever, but also about the recordings themselves. So, you know, is this a video? Is this an audio? Is it text? Or is it an image? Because later on, you'll have a big list of all of these different files, and you may not recall whether something was a video or an audio, or you may want to go and look at a video because you remember there was particularly good video and you want to be able to go back to it. And also keep track of the permissions for each item. So some items, you may have recorded some items that the speaker later on says, actually, you know, I don't think that one's for public use. Uh, I want you to archive it, but I don't want it to be made generally available. So you need to track the information about each particular file uh, and what can be done with it. Next. Uh, so as I said, you can use a spreadsheet. Uh, your archive may supply you with a spreadsheet, but keep in mind that the archives metadata doesn't have to match completely your metadata. You can, you can collect and store much richer metadata for your own purposes than, than the archive requires. But nevertheless, you can also use a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet keeps data in a structured form and you can see that you've got particular information in particular cells. Uh, you have to be disciplined in only putting that information into that cell. Uh, makes it easier to give to an archive later on. Next. Another way of doing this is to use a tool like La Meta. This is a tool that has been produced by a group of us um, in Delaman. And it's uh, recently out as a sort of almost version one. It works pretty well. As you can see here, it exports to a number of different formats for um, different archives. And we can add new archival formats here if required. It's currently available also in Spanish and Portuguese, um, and it's cross-platform so that it works on Mac and Windows. And what does it do next? Uh, it lets you describe files on your laptop. So you put your files that you were recording during the day uh, onto a laptop, and Lameda will see those files, and then you can assign these metadata project ID, you can have information about all the aspects of the project and you can see that it's putting it into fields which it will then be able to present to the archive as structured text. Next. Um, you can add information about people names. Uh, here there's information you can in then add, uh, you know, uh, personal information dates and so on. Uh, those people then become available to you next when you go to um, look at the sessions next. So in a session, uh, you can see that it's looked at your computer, it's found um, file names uh, and it presents those file names to you and you are then able to describe them. And here, in this case, it's got an audio file and it can play that audio file to you, which is useful if you have to remind yourself uh, what's on that file um, to enter the metadata. Video, it will play the video for you. Next. And images. So Lametta's a really useful tool. I'd really recommend uh, that you investigate using it. Uh, and it will help with archiving your materials later. Next. So the other aspect of uh, metadata in an archive is that language archives, as Susan said, use particular language terms and um, also uh, use language codes. And some of the language archives are part of the open language archives community. And this then harvests this uh, material from the archive. So every day, 
the archives provide metadata to OLAC and it creates these single pages. And you can see the URL there with the three letter code at the end. It creates one of these pages for each of the languages of the world that has a three letter code. So it's a great way of finding resources in a particular language. The structured metadata that OLAC suggests we use. Next. Oh, it skipped a slide. Yeah, thanks. And so also having that information in OLAC means that we can then do these higher level visualizations. So this is looking at where there is information in language archives by language. So each of these dots represents a language and it represents by color how many resources there are. And as you can see, there's an awful lot of red, which is languages with very few resources in language archives. And if you click on this map, you can click through and it will take you back to that OLAC page. But this is all possible because we as researchers in the first place have created good metadata and the archives have acted as custodians of that data and they've served it up to the open language archives community, which makes it more accessible for the speakers of the language to find in the future. The I'm going to take over here uh, and I'm going to be talking about something that you should be doing all the time uh, together with when you put together your metadata, which you should do at the end of every single day uh, when you're in the field. And that is evaluate your files and do a data appraisal, which basically means look at what you've recorded and think about um, how, whether this is going to go into an archive or not. And it's really important for us, for the archives, because archiving is really expensive. Every gigabyte costs money, and an archive is really not a private Dropbox where you can sort out things later. This is a general comment for this whole process of what you're doing. There's a lot of things that you're doing in addition to your academic work or your language maintenance and revitalization work or your cultural work. If you wait with the archiving as an afterthought, it gets too much and it gets more and more and more. And I can imagine just head started in year one to sort this out and not have like hours and hours on different hard drives and computers. And now it's too much to go through to get it ready for an archive. So do it always right away. And what you need to do is basically a data appraisal. Um, next slide. The way to think about it is that it's an analogy, right? If you do a publication, if you write a paper or you write a book or you do a publication, it's the same thing that you do with your collection, right? You edit it, you write it, you rewrite it, you clean it out and then you edit it and you put it in a format so that it's easy to read and smooth on the eye and so on. And the same thing has to happen with your collection. There are three levels that you can look at and one is the quality of the recording, the uniqueness, the importance of what you have captured and of course the sensitivity. And I will go through those three levels to um, give you hints about how to evaluate in the evening when you look at, oh my God, I took 450 pictures and probably angles. Next slide. So one of the things that we often see and you know, my, uh, my photo album looks like this. I have one scene and I take 50 pictures of the same scene. There's no need to deposit all of them. Choose the best to represent what you wanna represent and choose it in a nice way. So choose which one is the one and we don't need duplicates and triplicates and quadruplicates. If you wanna you know, have your hard drive and your computer full, that's great. For the archive, choose the one and then create the metadata for it. Next one, next slide. The next one is to look at your audio and your video quality. And we all know it has happened, you know, the mic wasn't on, there was a mic battery in the mic. You didn't bring a mic. Um, so you have no sound versus some sound versus noisy sound. And then you're embarrassed and think, oh my God, I'm putting it in an archive and then people are gonna see how bad I am at recording. But maybe you have recorded this very first time where these incredible classifiers are, you know, in there where, where a certain event happens, where a gesture happens that is absolutely directed and no one has ever recorded this. While the film might be a bit blurry or the sound might not be great, if it's absolutely unique, do not kick it out, do not throw it away. So you need to evaluate the importance of what is captured and still captured versus the quality. And one of the things that is really important to keep in mind 
you are not a filmmaking, a, a camera woman or a sound technician. You're a linguist or a community member or a speaker in the field doing something that is actually really challenging by yourself with equipment. You don't have a full team that is doing all these things around you. On the video side, where we often see it might be too light, you can darken it. If it's too dark, you can light it up. It might be blurry, or you might have caught the wrong people in the frame. Someone from the back of the frame is say saying something really important, and you can't see it because you framed it well. Is it going to be interesting? Can it be used for different kinds of purposes? It might not be what you wanted to capture, but it might be actually, you know, the important grandmother who is, you know, doing something with the child and, you know, cooking some great food or, you know, a shamanic ritual, who knows. What we also often see if people do, you know, have a camera running, um, you see how the camera is running and then someone walks into the frame, you see the backside of that person and they walk out of the frame and there's 20 minutes, nothing happening. Or, you know, the conversation ends, people leave it and there's 30 minutes of nothingness. You can edit this really simply. So cut it out because, you know, length of the movie, costs storage space. So the key part is the uniqueness of the materials and not we're gonna give this you know, to Hollywood and win a award for it, it's documentary linguistics, right? We're not doing documentary movie making. Next slide. And here comes one of the key parts and we have mentioned this. It is important that you evaluate what you're doing, what you're recording. Um, in terms of sensitivities. You need to have the informed consent. You need to be aware, is there private information? Is there politically sensitive information or socially sensitive information? You know, if people gossip, they might gossip about the neighbor. And you know, if this can become a problem, you need to be very aware. And this is not something you wanna sort out later, you know, two, three years down the line, when you have, you know, 50, 60 hours and need to go back and check, ooh, can I really put this in an archive? You wanna sort it out right then and there. You also need to make sure that when you have your transcription and do translation that you have an eye on, it. can this go public? Can this go into an archive? And really reevaluate the consent. It's an iterative process. It changes over time and you need to be open to this. You also need to sort out, importantly, the access restrictions that you have in the archive and maybe the access situation with the funder. Maybe you will archive certain things in some an archive and other things in another archive. So this is the data appraisal that is really key to do and not to wait to the very end, but to, to integrate this into your workflow when you are collecting your materials. Duh. So next slide. The bottom line, you know, a documenter is not a camera woman or a sound technician or a filmmaker. So you don't have to, you know, have the perfect shots. An archive is not a Dropbox where you just dump everything that you have and think you will sort it out later. You won't have the time. It's too much work. It's a lot of material. It's an ongoing process. And a good tip is keep the best shots of things that went wrong and use it in your teaching. Your students will love it. And now we can, I think, go over to the next question and answer session. Reina. Yes, I'm meeting our, mediating our next question and answer session. And actually, I think I'm going to turn it right back over to Mandana because we had several questions pertaining to La Meta, mm -hmm. uh, which I think you uh, maybe just um, talk about it a little bit more as a resource. Um, yeah, uh, La Meta was developed um, together with um, uh, Paradisec and with Gary from uh, Hawaii. It was built on the model of Seymour. That's why it looks similar. It was also built by John Hatton. We um, work with him. Uh, what was key for us is that there is a simple metadata tool where you can collect metadata in a simple format that's pretty transparent, has a lot of the functionalities of same, not all, and that can work on Macs and on PCs. The tool is now going into, is now coming out of the beta. It's really stable. It works very nicely. We have tested it. ELDP uh, grantees and ELAR uh, depositors have tested it with us um, very patiently. We're really, really grateful. The people that um, helped us translate it, you know, the people fr from Belen, um, Anna Bilassi and Sebastian Rude did it's a Spanish version. So please come on and help us translate it so may more people can use it. It's very stable. It doesn't crash and it's, it's running smoothly. So I can recommend it. We like it a lot. And our grantees also like it a lot. 
there are a couple of bugs that we're fixing that the moment when you export it, it duplicates the file size. So there are some problems, but we have, you know, we're putting together a frequently asked question page to address them. Awesome, thank you. Um, a uh, question from Kira about um, thoughts on how to account for bit rot or bit decay as we try to establish stable archives, which I'm going to send over to Paul. Yeah, it's a bit, bit of a technical story. So what what repositories do to uh, counter this is in the first place to store multiple copies of the files. Um, and then you need to also store what they call checksums of the files so that you can, uh, a checksum is, can be computed on a file to detect any small change, whether, whether a bit is different. Um, and then you need to have a procedure to regularly validate the, the checksum that you've stored against the current checksum of the file to see whether the file has, has changed. And if it has changed, you need to uh, restore the file from one of the other copies that you've that you've stored. So that's that's what most uh, archives and repositories uh, do. Wonderful, thank you. And I think that's actually all of the questions that haven't already been answered um, in the chat. Um, if you come up with more questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. But uh, I think we will move on since we're right about a time anyway. Could we go to step seven? Great. So um, now that we've heard um, quite a bit about um, metadata, we start the archival process. I'm going to talk a bit now about how to prepare a deposit for an archive. Next slide. Some of the primary activities that you'll be involved with in preparing an archival deposit have to do with understanding the archive's requirements on file structure developing strategies for arranging the files that you developed into folders, enhancing the discoverability of your collection with informative titles for those folders, and if necessary, converting files to required formats. Next slide. Many researchers have fairly elaborate file structures on their own computers and, in the, and that come about in the course of their own research projects. So you might have a top level folder that um, is um, all the work that you've done with a particular language community and that might be subdivided into years and months and different kinds of work that you're doing. Um, all of that um, file structure, next slide please, um, needs to be substantially reduced um, since most digital Um, that basically consists of two parts, um, a collection level and a folder level. And within those folders, there might be multiple digital files. So there's a translation process that has to um, happen between whatever file structure you've had um, personally and um, whatever the archives requirements uh, uh, demand. Next slide. There are some terminological differences to be aware of between um, archives, and I won't go through all of this here. Um, those two different levels that I called the collection level and the folder level um, get called different things by different archives. Um, as you can see on this table, collection is fairly common um, for that level, but then the folder level might be called other things like item or bundle, for example. Um, and that's just uh, to be aware of so that you, um, there's no confusion when you begin interacting more with the archive. Next slide. Here's an example of uh, the, flat, uh, the flat structure of a collection in the California Language Archive. Um, this is a snippet of a long list of items or bundles uh, numbered down the left-hand side here. Um, and each one has a title. Um, and then you see in parentheses to the right um, an indication of what sorts of digital files are contained, if any. Um, sometimes we have things that are just on paper and do not have corresponding digital files. Um, this is from a collection by a current Berkeley graduate student, Emily Drummond of Nukuoro. Um, next slide. Um, if we click on one of those uh, bundles, so this is the bottom one that you saw on the previous page, um, we get additional metadata uh, that displays in the, in, in the digital catalog. And then what I wanna draw your attention to is at the bottom of this. So now we're looking inside one folder um, and we just similarly have a flat structure of a long list of digital files contained in this folder. Um, so we have two uh, MOV files and a WAVE file. Next slide. So um, the term that we use to describe this process is uh, called uh, developing arrangement strategies um, 
for your collection, which is basically um, deciding what the governing principles are for those different folders. Um, the, the example we saw on the previous page, if I actually we could go back one slide, is an example of organizing a folder by a, rec uh, a recording session or a work session. Um, so you can see it in the upper part of this metadata, this is um, all collected on June 14th, 2019. Um, with one speaker of the language and um, one researcher. And so this is sort of all the work that was done on that day with this person. Next, uh, to, uh, this slide, please, yes. Um, other ways um, that we can go about this are um, developing folders by the particular variety of a language you might be working on, the location where you did the work, um, the speaker you were working with, um, uh, regardless of what the date is, for example. Um, and. Uh, in addition to some other um, possibilities. One thing to keep in mind is that if you're going to be archiving incrementally, which um, we strongly encourage you to do, um, um, of, your, um, of your folders. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, this is an example of an arrangement by speaker. Um, so this is during a um, time spent in the community between um, May and August, 2016. Um, Amoya Skilton um, was working uh, with a speaker of Tikuna named Elvira Coelho. And um, th this bundle includes all of the files um, that were made during that summer. Um, and um, for example, though, if, if you wanted to have a, a bundle that spanned multiple years, um, that would come with restrictions on how often you could archive. So those are it's an example of the kind of thing to keep in mind. Next slide. Um, in terms of how, what to call your titles, um, we encourage you to think about how um, discoverable they can be. So one um, sort of high level principle is to avoid redundant titles um, for items. So um, this is an example of a collection of uh, materials on IMO. It's just called a licitation session. Um, next slide. Um, if we expand out some of that list, um, the different bundles are actually can be differentiated based on um, the names of contributors or actors in each of those um, sessions um, and by the description field. Um, but as you saw in the previous slide, that information does not display um, in every version of our digital catalog, which can make it, things a little hard to discover. Um, so next slide. An ideal situation would be something more like this. This comes from the materials of a different field methods class. Um, where the actual titles of the, of the um, items are differentiated by what grammatical topic was concentrated on um, in each case. You'll see here, for example, with possessive pronouns. Next slide. Um, one small point here, um, which has already been covered somewhat, um, in addition to consulting with your archive before you start um, producing digital files, um, there's usually inevitably some um, Um, and um, it's good to ha have a sort of a second check-in with the archive um, when it comes time to, um, to be really preparing your deposit in term, uh, to make sure that all your files are in the proper format. Next slide. Um, and finally, um, during this process of, of um, preparing the deposit, um, you're in, in mo with most digital language archives, you're gonna be interacting um, to some degree with a self-upload tool. Um, not all language archives have this, but it's um, fairly common now where you, not only will you be responsible for having created the metadata, um, that you will also be responsible for uploading the digital files um, associated with that metadata. And exactly how this works will um, look different um, from archive to archive. The uh, image I have here on the right is from the California Language Archive um, and our tool for this, which we call our pre-archive, which is um, one way that you log in and upload files. Next slide. Um, so now um, our second to last step um, has to do with um, what you might hear called progressive archiving or incremental archiving. Next slide. Um, the idea behind this is simply that the, uh, the model of behind archiving has changed a lot in the last um, several years um, from something that happened at the end of someone's career um, or after many years of working on a project to something that um, ideally happens on a more regular basis, either once a year or um, even multiple times within a year. Um, and I, the idea is that there's a cyclical process where um, we document um, linguistic and cultural practices um, that results um, in a certain number of born digital files that have metadata that we create. Um, then we transition into a period of preparing that collection for the archive and then um, uploading those, those materials to the archive, which then can feed back 
um, into the next um, period of uh, documentation or the next phase of, of documentation work that we do. Um, next slide. Um, the benefits um, from archiving often um, um, and other stakeholders regularly and much earlier than in the past. Um, it allows for archived materials to feed back into subsequent documentation, as I mentioned. Um, for people in particular kinds of institutions, it can satisfy expectations and requirements um, for departments or funders. Um, and um, there's a lot of benefits also to, uh, to the process itself. So it can avoid um, overwhelmingness, as was talked about earlier, if, uh, just in terms of the quantity of work that has to be done. Um, it means that we're not duplicating the process of organizing our files and archiving the files if we do it often. Um, the context in which the work, uh, the documentation was done is more recent and that makes um, various aspects of creating metadata and engaging with communities about issues of access um, easier. Um, and it um, safeguards against um, the inadvertent loss of materials if there's um, a um, if a hard drive crashes or if, or if data is stolen in some way. Next slide. Um, and I wanna highlight a few technical issues to be aware of um, when you're thinking about frequent um, or incremental archiving. Um, all archives allow you to add folders to a collection. Um, so it's always possible to expand a collection in some way. Um, how that has to happen um, can differ. Um, one particular difference to be aware of is that um, not all archives allow you to add files to folders. Um, and so uh, with those screenshots from the California Language Archive a few slides back, for example, we saw um, we saw folders that contained some number of digital files. Um, uh, for our archive, for example, that is sort of a frozen unit. Um, no digital files can be added to that folder. And instead what needs to happen is a new folder needs to be created and then related to that previous folder in some way. Um, other archives allow you to add files to folders even after the um, folder has been made public. Um, in contrast, in uh, almost all cases, files cannot be deleted. Um, so if a later file needs to supersede one, um, it's added and um, a relation is, is indicated um, saying that by um, being careful about versioning files, um, which you have an example of here, um, so that users of the archive understand the difference between um, earlier and later um, files. Next slide. And I just want to give one quick example um, how you, um, so that you can see how files can be added, um, even if they can't be added to the same folder. So this is a folder from the California Language Archive um, that is recordings of child language that um, includes uh, three digital files. Um, and you'll see um, in the upper red circle here that there's a relation to a different item in our catalog. And if you go to the next slide, um, this is that other item. Um, and this contains the transcription for those. Um, and so that the user can click back and forth between the folder that contains the audio and the folder that contains the transcription. Next slide. Great, right now. Okay, so we've made it to the last step, um, which is describing your collection, which um, is what you do once you have all of your collection materials together. Next slide. So a collection description is a standalone guide to a collection that summarizes the entirety of your collection in a single document. So while probably most of your time in preparing your deposit um, will be spent carefully describing your items, resources, files, or whatever they're called <laughs> um, for your archive, the collection description is actually incredibly helpful and it really behooves you to take time to write this instead of treating it as an afterthought. Um, the collection description is a gateway to your materials, and it's often where you have the most flexibility to give a free form characterization of your work um, for a variety of audiences in sort of a format of your choosing. Um, collection descriptions are also called finding aids or collection guides, often if they're, um, they include an inventory of the materials. Um, and these can be especially So if you archived um, in the community with the, your um, institution, if you've had different projects over different years that are related but ended up in different places for grant reasons, um, this is definitely the place to put that. Um, also, if your archive doesn't offer multilingual support in the languages that you need, this is a great place to put that information as well. Um, 
Also, these are absolutely key if, for example, um, your local archive doesn't, isn't a digital archive or doesn't have a lot of um, support for complex metadata, particularly at like a file item level, um, then one of these, a carefully constructed collection guide is absolutely essential. So I had to write one of these for um, my um, personal work um, with NNFLIP and uh, my local repository only um, had sort of a collection card that goes with your hard drive and all of the rest of the file description um, has to go in a guide that you write. Um, data for your larger archives like Delamont archives, but um, they can also be archived along with um, your collection as an item. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of things that these can include, um, and we'll start with what it should definitely include, and then other things that you know are a good idea to include if you can. Um, but the must-haves are um, the reason um, for collection, so um, what the work was and why you, or if you're not the original collector, why the original collection happened. Um, a history of the project and the materials, which can also include like curatorial history if the materials have been at multiple institutions. For example, the Native American Languages Collection here, we have some materials from the National Anthropological Archives because um, it was beneficial to people to have local copies here. Um, it's also helpful to have an overview of the contents, the languages and communities represented, and then um, a title. And the archive will usually also assign um, a permanent identifier to the collection. Next, it can be included, um, although access is ideally more granular than it, and at the collection level. Um, you can also have an access statement. You know, these materials are open, um, you know, with reciprocal licenses or, you know, whatever you want. Um, relevant dates, uh, relevant funding agencies, a list of relevant individuals, um, which can often your primary collaborators, uh, depositors, collectors, your project team members, um, biographical sketches, um, you can get really detailed if you want to. Um, an inventory of the collection materials, which you can either assemble or the archive may assemble as well. Um, any description of this hierarchical structure um, if that wasn't determined by the archive for your materials and then also any conventions that you used. So for example, if you were in your file names labeling speakers with um, initials, for example, um, then that would be really helpful to note. Um, citation information, which you can the name of the repository, any technical specifications um, for your recordings. Um, keywords, genres, and subject labels are very, very helpful um, for you to assign to your materials. I'll show you a good example of that in a second. Um, expected additions. So if you know that your collection is going to grow, if you have more work um, that you're going to be doing, then that's helpful to note. And then any associated um, publications with your materials, um, which may or may not also be archived as part of your deposit. Uh, next slide, please. So I've just given some links here to um, some collection guides in various archives. And next slide, please. And then also some sample collection descriptions that have been published in language documentation and conservation. So um, it's sort of a new thing, but it's very exciting that you can write a really detailed collection guide and have it be a publication. Um, and it makes it all the more accessible. So it's a win all the way around. Um, I put a couple examples in here. Let's see if they work. Next slide, please. Um, so this is an example from the Native American Languages Collection. You kind of can't see it very well, but you can see it's got the things that we talked about, like languages, dates, um, people involved, the collection identifier, um, access level information, a description, and then a full inventory of the collection materials. Next. And then this is going to be the American Philosophical Society's pages. They recently completed a grant to really um, improve their collection guides for Native American materials, and they have some really wonderful um, examples. So there's a lot, whole lot of text and background information in addition to detailed inventory um, information. This is Mary Haas's collection, which is 95 linear feet, um, which is huge, uh, and then a detailed inventory on how to access the materials. Next, please. Um, and um, and it has all the things we've been talking about, but also some other really cool things. So next slide. 
um, which include, for example, uh, genetic information about the language, location information, and several maps. Next. Um, and a multitude of pictures, which is really wonderful. Um, it really brings the research to life. Next. Um, and just as a cautionary note, um, sometimes people don't always provide this information. You know, the archive doesn't always request it. Um, and if it's not provided, then the archive is going to take its best shot, which their odds are good that they're going to be conservative, particularly if there aren't any transcriptions or any other information to use. So this is an example um, from our collection where the depositor didn't give us very much information, and this is what the collection description looks like. So there's no scope and contents. Um, the collection contains audio recordings of Kiowa and Navajo songs, stories, ceremonies, and gatherings, and that's um, a little bit. Okay, uh, I believe it's questions. Yeah. That's right. We have uh, a few minutes now for questions. So please um, put them in the chat. We, we have had a few questions. Um, so there, there is this issue of version control. I think a few people have talked about. Um, and it's, uh, it's treated differently by different archives. I know that. Um, but I don't know if any of the panelists wants to have a, a go at answering that question. Okay, so from Paradisic's point of view, we will store, for example, a dictionary file that gets incremented over time. Um, we'll just store a new version that has the date in the file name. Uh, we don't have a sophisticated version control system in our current catalog, but if you come to my talk in the next session, you'll hear about an exciting new way we're doing uh, the catalog, which includes versioning. Archive uh, indicating which version they are. And so you can then cite different versions of the same material. Does anybody else have any? Yeah, I've, I've got something to add. So version control can be a really tricky topic when you're talking about archives and in particular material that people might have cited. So <clears throat> at ILA, we don't necessarily have a way of knowing if someone has cited a particular file that might be in the archive. And then if um, the depositor of that file comes to us later and wants to replace it with a newer version, we are reluctant to remove the original version in the case that it might have been cited somewhere, right? So we always want data to be um, findable and you want to be able to resolve you know, that citation back to the original data set that was cited. So that's the reason um, we do practice very careful version control um, and we never replace one file with another file. Um, the natural language processors, the, the people who are doing natural language processing who work with us to download large quantities of files are quite familiar with the need to massage data at times. Um, so we haven't had much pushback from the people who are like our bulk users of the data on this area. Um, and it, it really is on a smaller scale that these issues come up. Now to date, we haven't had a situation where we replaced or did a new version of an Elan file. If people are doing that, they're doing it with the self-deposit forms that we have. So we're, we're not really aware if they are doing it. Um, the, they do not have the ability to, to delete any files. They only have the ability to add files to the archive. So that's the reason it really has to do with making sure that the citations are resolvable back to the original data set that was cited. Are there any other? <laughs> yeah, I can add it. In our case, we, we, we version files and uh, we assign a new handle persistent identifier to the newer version. So the old persistent identifier, the handle that was used for the old version still would resolve to the old version, the newer gets a new one. So that, that way, if, if it was cited with the persistent identifier, it would still be uh, resolvable. Um, so we have a question now from Claire Bowen about the tension between a living archive and a static archive. Um, I think uh, I would say that they're the same thing. Um, a static archive is, you know, fixed, um, but 
it's it's interacting with people all the time. So the static archive and living archive really, I think, are the same thing. Um, you know, the point of the archive is to get material back. We're trying to get material back to source communities and they're going to be commenting on material. They're going to be adding more material. They're going to be using it for revitalizing practice, hopefully. And some of that material may come into the collection. So the static bit uh, feeds the living bit. And I think the both of them um, coexist. Um, do any other panelists want to say anything about that? I, I would maybe add that I think that one of the things that makes archives traditionally be static is that the people involved in the process are either not at, only minimally involved or are involved only when their materials are given at some very late point. And so it's, it's I think, uh, part of what makes archives more living is to have this sort of regular engagement, both with the depositors and community people. Um, yep. Um, there's another question now about can access be changed after depositing? I think each archive probably. Because we have um, quite a bit, we have graded access and the access is determined by the depositor or and the community that give us the um, licensing agreement and determine um, access on a bundle. And if anything changes, they just get in touch and then we close something if it's necessary. Um, we have a takedown policy in case, you know, there is something that is in any way offensive um, and you uh, contact us, then we will contact the depositor and then we take it down. Yes, in ELAR, uh, you can change access um, and inform us. I'll add that one of the issues with um, changing access from very open to restricted is that there's no way to know where those materials are already circulating outside of the archive. So if they've been unrestricted in the archive for you know, a year, then presumably somebody might have downloaded them and shared them with their research team or you know, their community or something. Really tracking every single file that gets downloaded out of the archive. Um, that would be an invasion of privacy. And so we don't do that. So, you know, it's, it's a question of um, what are the consequences of putting something in unrestricted in the first place that you think might need to be restricted later? Does it happen? Yes, it happens all the time. And at ILA, people are constantly changing, uh, asking us to change the restrictions for them. Um, but we encourage people to, if they're in doubt when they put something in the archive, restrict it. Um, if they're, if, you know, the, their memorandum of understanding or their contract with, you know, some sort of funding agency allows them to put the material into the archive restricted, then it's always better to err on the side of caution at first. Yeah, absolutely. I think we need to maybe just take um, maybe one more question is, uh, David Bradley has a question about ISO codes not always being stable, uh, one code divided into... I want to take that oh on. yeah we we so we use um linked data to do this so that um when where we have the language code stored in the archive we can go and we can change that language code and then it changes it everywhere in the archive that it shows up so it's a pretty easy fix in the yeah. case of the cla we often have language terms that are more fine-grained than things that have iso codes and mm -hmm. um and there's i mean uh, I mean, we also have the similar sort of linked data that Susan describes, but it, um, it means that we um, are often making small changes to um, language terms as people have suggestions or uh, preferences or things like that. And there's also, um, you know, Glottolog is a more fine-grained set of codes than ISO. And in Australia, we have Auslang codes, which are more fine-grained as well. So ISO is, you know, it's the, the big elephant, uh, but it's not the only source of information. Uh, it is the one that OLAC's using at the moment, but we hope that OLAC will. Look, I think we've um, come to the end of our time. So I'm just going to ask uh, Raina if she will do the final closing for our session. Yes, absolutely. So thank you for coming. Uh, and we hope that this was helpful to you as you think about your own work and work that you're going to be doing. Um, this wasn't meant to be intimidating. I hope that it wasn't. Um, it's not as complicated as it might appear. Um, we're here to help you through the process. So please, you know, contact us and talk to us if you're um, depositing with our repositories or just have any questions. We'd be happy to help you. 
Um, so these are some pointers on data management to help you think through uh, your next grant or your current projects in a way that will make life easier for you. Um, and sort of the takeaway from this is that some work on the front end saves a lot of work afterwards. Don't wait until the end of the project or until it's you know done to start off. Perfect. Um, archiving is meant to be part of the process, not the endpoint, right? It's an iterative cyclical thing. Um, and it, it's important to put your materials in an archive, which is long-term stable storage. Um, Dropbox, file shares, YouTube is all great for dissemination and co-work uh, on documents and things like that. But um, it is really important at the end of the day for things to arrive in an archive. Um, Along with this is the idea that you should archive often. Um, if you aren't already part of the language community, you need to involve the community early on and make sure all stakeholders have access. Um, depending on you know, the local situation, this might involve archiving multiple places um, and some creative thinking uh, to make sure that things really are accessible. Um, everyone's goal here is the same, you know, to make language data accessible in the most useful way possible for uh, language workers, community members, everyone. Or even just another researcher's work knows that it's incredibly difficult to walk in to someone else's project and be able to just understand what's going on. Um, it takes a lot of careful thought to make that journey easy for the people who are gonna come after you. Um, it's tough and it does require some time, but uh, taking the time to do it is incredibly valuable. And uh, it's important to remember that no one is ever gonna be in a better position to do that than you are in the moment that you're working with those materials. Um, lastly, but most importantly, archiving is part of our responsibility to our people, our friends, elders, everyone that you know we work with. The point of what all of us here do is that the work lives on beyond us. So with that, um, I'd like to close. Uh, like to thank our sponsors um, and uh, mahalo to the ICLDC7 organizing committee. If you wanna check out the PowerPoint that we have shared somewhere. <laughs> So there's some um, people in the chat saying they've not been able to copy things out of the chat. They can't copy the links out. Um, so I was going to create a bit.ly link really quickly to uh, send out to you all. I, I'm not very mul good at multi. I'll stop talking so I can create the bit.ly link. Susan, the last slide has all of the links on it. So if they have a link to the slides, they'll be able to find all of these links there. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you to all our presenters. Um, we're finishing on time, so that's great. Um, but thank you, as they mentioned, there, uh, the slides uh, do have the link there. Yeah. Oops. So that is what I'm going to make the bit.ly link, but it hasn't let me do it yet. So <laughs> if anyone is still in here to see that, ICLDC archiving, uh, ICLCD7 archiving all in caps will be the back end of the bit.ly link. I lost the link to the slides. <laughs> we can probably make it available in some, in some way through <laughs> yes. the organizers. <laughs> Is anyone still here? We should sign off. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
All right, thank you very much. See you. Thanks everyone, we're gonna be ending the session now. <laughs>